كان يحب ده اصلا كان I'm going to give them one more minute. Everyone's running from Zoom to Zoom. <laughs> or, yeah. teams, or Teams to Zoom. That's the challenge nowadays. These back to backs. Okay, well, we will get started with the IPM seminar for this month. Um, and we are very pleased to have as our speaker, Elaine Mardis. Um, Elaine is currently the PhD, uh, is the co-executive director of the Steve and Cindy Rasmussen Institute for Genomic Medicine at Nationwide Children's Hospital and holds the Rasmussen Nationwide Foundation Endowed Chair of Genomic Medicine. She's also Professor of Pediatrics at the Ohio State University College of Medicine. As you could guess, she's only a couple of hours away from us. So when COVID has ended and we're back to meeting in person, it would be great next time to have her in person. Mm -hmm. uh, Elaine was educated at the University of Oklahoma with a BS in zoology and a PhD in chemistry and biochemistry. She actually did her postgraduate work at industry, kind of interesting, at Byrad Laboratories, um, and then was a member of the faculty at Washington University School of Medicine from 1993 to 2016. As many of you know, this is one of the three major sites for the sequencing of the human genome. And her group uh, in total contributed about 20% of the human genome in total. During this process, uh, Dr. Marlis became one of the most recognized genomics experts in the US, and that's one of the reasons we invited her today. Uh, Dr. Marlis has authored uh, over 380 articles in peer reviewed journals and is listed uh, since 2013 as one of the most highly cited researchers in the world by Thomson Reuters. Uh, she's received a number of awards. I just, I won't say all of them, but just a few of them. She was given the Morton K. Schwartz Award from the American Association for Clinical Chemistry in 2016, and the Heath Memorial Award from the MD Anderson Cancer Center in 2020. Uh, Dr. Marlis is the immediate past ACR president um, and was a elected a fellow of the ACR Academy. And she was elected to membership in the National Academy, Academy of Medicine in 2019. Uh, on a personal note, I spend every week with Elaine in a meeting um, as we participate together in a national sequencing program of metastatic breast cancer, where Elaine's group is doing the genome sequencing of the breast cancers. And then that data comes back to Pittsburgh, where a group of us, including DBMI and the supercomputing center, wrangle that data, handle that data, and then and serve it up to others. And so I'm really pleased to invite her today to give a speak. And we're very, uh, as our institution, just like yours, is very interested in genomic medicine and the opportunities and then the challenges that come with that. And so Elaine, please take it away. I should say at the end, uh, if you want to ask questions, you can put them in the chat or we will also unmute people so we can have um, verbal questions as well if you want at the end, you can do it by chat or by speaking up. Thank you. Wonderful, thanks so much, Adrian. It's a pleasure to be um, 
I guess, in Pittsburgh virtually. So um, I'm, I'm really excited to talk about some of the work that we've been doing focused on uh, pediatric cancer uh, precision medicine uh, here at Nationwide Children's Hospital. So uh, pediatric cancer, not much more to say than this. It's the leading cause of death by disease in the developed world in children older than one year of age. And um, really the challenge that I wanna talk about today that underlies all of the work that we've been doing is survivorship. So if we look at a recent um, publication from JAMA Oncology last year, um, looking backwards over the decades of children diagnosed with cancer from the 70s, 80s and 90s um, and evaluating sources of uh, mortality, uh, what we can see is that, you know, uh, here I'm showing just sort of a subset of the data from this paper, looking at children treated with chemotherapy alone on the left, radiotherapy alone on the right. And really, we haven't moved the needle all that much. Let's face it. I think the challenges in, in terms of, you know, uh, differences uh, over the decades really don't amount to much and really tell us that, um, adult survivors of pediatric cancer remain at risk for many aspects that are sequela of these very aggressive treatments given in childhood, including shortened lifespan and secondary cancer diagnoses. Um, so really the studies I'll talk about today and the work that we're doing um, is committed to changing this reality by making precision approaches to cancer care uh, for these patients, more a part of the practice of medicine, uh, mainly by the inclusion of genomics. Um, I think I'll, I'll use sort of the comparison and contrast to adult uh, precision cancer medicine um, that Mike Berger and I reported on from the standpoint of the involvement of genomic data in helping to determine precision medicine uh, answers for adult patients shown on the right from a couple of years ago in Nature Review's clinical oncology, where we really outlined that with a fairly straightforward data set, tumor uh, NGS data, sometimes including non-tumor, um, just to get at germline susceptibility, we really you know, have a plethora of choices available to us, if you will, in the adult precision cancer medicine setting. And the idea you know, that I'd like to advance today is that we'd love to bring this paradigm to pediatric patients, but there are some challenges that we have to face up to. And one of the challenges is that unlike adults, really looking at DNA alone is not enough. I'll try to emphasize that um, throughout um, because pediatric cancers really typically have few mutations and often just getting a FDA approved drug to target a specific mutation in the pediatric setting becomes quite difficult. Variety of sources of difficulty, but probably one of the chief ones that we've seen in our um, work here is that dosage and un those unknown adverse event profiles sometimes even prevent uh, providers from going in that direction um, because of the challenges there. Um, we know that this stems from the fact that clinical trial enrollment, although the ages have dropped a bit recently, really excludes pediatric patients. And thankfully, new legislation is encouraging you know, pharmaceutical companies with new agents going on to clinical trials to open pediatric uh, patient arms. Um, but still, the challenge is that pediatric cancer is a rare disease and so accrual and getting sufficient numbers to really drive FDA approval can be quite challenging. And um, so, you know, it's not a perfect scenario just yet. Um, and I won't talk much about immunotherapies today, except for some new work that we're doing right at the end, but they, you know, in many cases don't uh, get considered either uh, with the exception, obviously, of CAR-T cell therapies. So a few years ago, as Adrian mentioned, uh, moved from WashU to Nationwide Children's. Um, one of the first protocols that we open in what we uh, use as a model for introducing genomics into the practice of medicine, a translational protocol um, we spun up in um, uh, pediatric cancer. And um, this opened in January of 2018. It's a very a comprehensive protocol, as you can see from the list of assays on this slide that really take DNA and RNA extracts from disease involved in compared or normal tissue, um, submit them to a variety of assays, including um, NGS and microarray based assays, and then um, perform a variety of data analytics, variant annotation, interpretation, and reporting. 
Um, in particular, just briefly, the enhanced tumor normal exome that we perform here obviously assays all of the genes in the genome, but because of the importance of focal and arm and whole chromosome level ploidy and amplification deletion changes that are um, oftentimes a prognostic in the pediatric setting, we enhance this exome to include um, high level coverage across the length of every chromosome. So about 30 KB resolution on every chromosome so that we have the uh, resolution and sensitivity to detect these copy number of ploidy changes. Um, RNA-seq is, um, I mentioned a minute ago, is, is also performed from the tumor we spin this out into a, mul a multitude of different analytic pipelines, and I'll touch on some of those today. Because of the increasing importance of the DKFZ classifiers in the context of methylation array data, um, we have also um, utilized the CNS and increasingly also the sarcoma classifier for these patients. Um, and then for uh, the last couple of years already, we've had targeted uh, panels to detect fusion drivers um, both in heme and solid tissue malignancies that were already in our CAPCLIA laboratory that's part of what falls under the IgM umbrella. So we perform here both research as well as um, clinical testing in, in the IgM. Um, most recently, and in response to some of the things I'll tell you about right at the end of today's talk, um, we have pushed the tumor normal exome as well as the methylation arrays also into our CAPCLIA validated um, test series. And we are um, actively um, finalizing those um, paperworky things around getting the results in EPIC and those sorts of things right now. So those should go live soon. In the next generation sequencing era, one can't do uh, what we do without you know, a significant amount of computational firepower. Uh, for those of you with a computational bent in the uh, audience, I'll talk a lot about what we're doing here uh, today. But suffice it to say that we uh, moved away from an on-premises database um, setup and data center setup, um, which we had at WashU, to entirely Amazon Web Services-based computing. This is all in a HIPAA-compliant um, atmosphere. Um, and we, as you can see from the diagram here, Top panel, take the tumor normal enhanced exome sequencing through um, our aligner, Churchill, um, and then and spin that into a number of different variant detection pipelines. Today, I won't focus about the nuts and bolts on this, but just talk about some recent improvements to FFPE filtering and tumor mutational burden calculation. And then in the bottom, the RNA-seq also aligns through Churchill um, takes advantage of a variety of different tools to really establish um, expression levels um, and looks at those in the context at the bottom of single sample gene set enrichment analysis and outlier analysis to identify potentially druggable targets, as well as in the um, sort of immune microenvironment um, aspect, deconvolutes the RNA-seq data to really understand changes in the TME. And then right in the middle, we've um, put a focused effort on fusion detection because, of course, um, driver fusions are often important in the context of pediatric cancer um, and in many cases are increasingly um, suitable for precision medicine um, uh, drug targets. So talk a little bit about the um, challenge of formal infixation compared to fresh frozen. Um, we really wanted to, um, because of the reality that many samples still come to us informal and in paraffin, start to address this in terms of, you know, sort of subtracting out the DNA damage, um, backbone damage from um, formalin. Um, and so what you see here is sort of the experimental setup for this approach where we had variety of uh, different samples, five um, cancer samples in particular, as indicated by the FAM numbers at the top from our cancer protocol, where we had both um, formal and fixed and fresh frozen disease involved um, tissue. And so we could take that tissue, extract the DNA and RNA, evaluate the DNA um, from both settings through our exome analysis and identify total variants. And you can see those listed in the table with the frozen on the top, um, row and the formal and fixed by comparison for that same sample on the row just beneath it. And then, of course, the total number of variants in common. And not surprisingly, you know, the numbers predominate in terms of formal and fixation, but these are largely artifactual, um, as you can see in terms of those um, two following uh, rows 
the percentage of variants from the frozen sample found in FFPE are high, but quite low in the ones found in the uh, FFPE sample that are unique to FFPE. And so on average, about a, um, for this small data set, about a 600% increase in, in the um, number of variants that are identified. So clearly a case where we don't want to have some poor person looking at IGV to subtract all these out. We just need to come up with an approach that gets rid of them um, without, of course, removing important variants at the same time. So this has obviously been tackled on a number of occasions. If you look in the literature, um, you can just um, talk a little bit about what we've done here in terms of our approach to variant filtering. Um, and that includes, you know, approaches that were informed by, you know, searching through what's been done in the past from the literature reports and really adding a little bit of our own um, ingenuity in on top of that. So sort of mundane things like increased stringency on the quality of evidence needed to call variants. Um, by not only looking at higher mapping quality, but also teasing out some of the other mapping quality related statistics as um, points to filter on. Um, identifying and filtering variants like those rejected by manual curation. Um, many of those we just took from our variant scientists and how they filter through and just turn that into an algorithm for, for you know, automated filtration uh, uh, out of these variants. Um, and then also some uh, obvious things like looking in regions with high error rates, um, clustered variants, et cetera. And then um, we also adjust filters to the specific sample. And this really takes into account the vagaries around formal fixation and paraffin embedding, which don't seem to have hard and fast um, SOP related approaches um, in the clinical setting. So we you know, see quite a bit of variability from one sample to the next. Um, just to show you the results of the artifact filtering improvements, um, these are being compared to the current FFPE filters in a Mutec 2, which is our variant caller. Um, on the left, we see uh, position-related variants, so where the uh, position-related filter overlaps. Um, we overlap 100% with the variants caught by Mutec, but also filter out 14 times more variants in this data set that we're evaluating. And then for quality-based filters, we've added two quality-related filters um, that overlap again at 100%, but also filter out six times more of, of the variants. And you can see the numbers in the table below. So uh, we're reasonably happy with this approach at this point in time. I think some additional testing is um, now underway on much larger um, sample numbers. Um, and we've sort of looked in aggregate at these test cases um, for your information about the impact on the variant assessment workload, if you will. How much does it diminish with filtering and how does that compare to the corresponding frozen samples? So you can see on the linear graph, uh, y-axis on the left, sort of the diminution and then uh, corrected on a log scale um, on the right-hand display. Um, for the variants before and after uh, filtering in the FFPE sample. So reasonable um, amount of decrease, um, as you saw from the numbers earlier. This actually turns out to be reasonably important as well for another uh, metric that we'd like to calculate from these data, which is, of course, tumor mutational burden. Not something we think a lot about in the pediatric setting, but a, an example I'll show you. It does happen. We do want to understand where patients fall in the TMB spectrum. And interestingly, after evaluating with other groups um, that are interested in uh, really the concordance between high TMB and potential for response to immune checkpoint blockade, we found that because of the overall lower um, uh, number of point mutations on average in pediatric cancer genomes, probably the mark for high TMB is not the 10 meg mutations per megabase that we see in adults, but probably closer to five. And so that's not a you know, accepted guidance right now um, from any you know, um, regulatory group or, or what have you, but I think um, we're keeping a close eye on this um, in the context of the fact that it may become a regulatory guidance um, point. So um, this just gives you an idea of um, uh, sort of where we're at with respect to formal and fixed um, specimens and the TMB calculation um, shown with just one example be to compare formal and to frozen, which is on the right on this diagram on the right. Here we have a patient with a primary and a met from formalin, and then the second metastasis sample is actually from, um, 
from fresh frozen tissue. And so they're roughly concordant with one another. Um, again, this is a log scale, um, a graph. So um, just, um, you know, showing the similarities and differences between those. And we're building a database, obviously, of, of this um, data as we go on. So I want to turn my attention now to the, um, the aspects of RNA expression. Um, one of the really valuable um, databases that we've used throughout our project, especially in the early days um, when we didn't have so many patients to compare RNA expression among um, similar um, diagnoses or histologies, is the Treehouse uh, database um, that's housed out at UC Santa Cruz, David Hausler's um, group. And this is really a compendium of data from a variety of different sources. We've now contributed data into this from our RNA-seq. Um, but these are the kind of resources that I love because really to use this, you don't need any you know, per se bioinformatics expertise. You can simply go to this website with a sample um, gene expression set of the top 500 expressed genes for the cancer that you're interested in and use these different tools, the cluster browser on the left in particular, to sort of cluster your patient's gene expression profile with a large database of other patients and really understand where that fit um, occurs. I'll show an example of this from some real patient data in a few minutes, but this is really, I think, a, a cool resource because it's so straightforward to use um, and the, the tools are just there and really all you need is a computer and the internet to um, gain some information for your patient. We've also used the treehouse in this gene expression outlier analysis, um, which um, used to look a little bit like this um, crazy busy graph here, um, uh, pursuing sort of differential expression um, based on this method from Kotari et al. from a 2013 cancer discovery paper cited along the bottom of the slide there. And initially, again, we were um, just, you know, sort of comparing the gene expression for our patients to the treehouse cohort um, because we didn't have enough patients ourselves to, to do that well. But over time, we've in included both treehouse plus IgM and then IgM alone for patients with similar histologies, as I mentioned. The real point of this is to um, begin to understand outlier gene expression, obviously, compared to the database, and ultimately to um, access, assess the drugability of these outlier genes. Um, here we use a database that I was involved in beginning um, to create at a WashU called the Drug Gene Interaction Database, or DGIDB. So what you can see here is just an example of a child with Ewing sarcoma. Um, the uh, illustrated by the red diamond on this um, box and whiskers plot. We're comparing here Jack one expression to the treehouse um, for a variety of different tissue histologies, but uh, aligning this um, child's diagnosis with Ewing sarcoma patients from that database. And um, on the right now, we're I'm showing the um, differential expression compared to just our in-house patients, um, non-CNS malignancies. Um, which would be a, a, in accordance with Ewing sarcoma and showing that uh, quite high um, uh, uh, expression of JAK1 for this patient um, just compared to another patient with a hematologic malignancy in the blue dots. So this can give us some context to possibilities that really probably likely stem from changes in chromatin packaging or epigenetic methylation changes, for example, that are influencing the expression of genes, but without them being mutated or even copy number altered. Um, and this can be really important in the context of a disease that in many cases is largely epigenetically driven, that is pediatric cancer, um, and really also speaks to the reason why some of these cancers have such low um, mutational load. It's because the drivers are coming from elsewhere. Speaking of drivers from elsewhere, um, I mentioned the focused attention that we have put towards um, really devising uh, what will hopefully be a clinically validated um, detection pipeline for fusions from RNA sequencing data. The strategy is really best exemplified by the diagram here on the right of the slide, just a total RNA sequencing ribo depleted library um, using a stranded approach goes into these seven different algorithms that are listed in the blue boxes. Cicero and Ariba are circled in yellow because they're the two recent additions 
uh, Reba is coming out of the DKF said, and Cicero comes from the St. Jude group. One of the really beneficial aspects of Cicero that I'll talk about for just a minute is the ability to also detect internal tandem duplications. These are uh, quite tricky to find from a bioinformatics standpoint, but um, the reason for all of the algorithms, of course, is because if you know any of these algorithms, you know that some of them uh, you know, have great strengths, some have weaknesses in terms of just the number of false positives. And of course, in the clinical setting, you, know, you don't want to miss anything. So it's a little bit over the top, I will admit. But really what we're doing here is cloud-based calling um, on the same data set then looking at the overlap between calls across the different algorithms and essentially taking any calls that are uh, agreed upon by more than three of the callers. That's a number that's been established over a lot of testing um, in, in comparison to clinically validated um, fusions that have been identified. And then we go through a series of filtering steps that include prioritization, knowledge-based filtering. This is especially um, knowledge of known false positives, things that come up frequently that are read-throughs or what have you um, that we can rapidly filter out because they're always false positives. And then um, ultimately we've taken many of these fusions um, because this is done in the research setting back to a CAP-CLIA validation step that's a very focused RT-PCR and sequencing and been 100% you know, um, correct about the driver fusions that we wanna confirm and write into the patient's medical record. So um, this is um, just now, um, I think, close to being um, accepted for publication, um, which has taken a ridiculously long time, but I won't go into that. Um, but it's um, also available as a, on GitHub. Um, so if you're interested in that, um, I can type the GitHub address into the chat later. Um, so you can go take a look at it. Just one example of internal tandem duplication detection from the Cicero algorithm. This is a child with FGFR1 in frame ITD, nine amino acids um, in a kinase domain there that are um, duplicated. And on the right hand side of the slide, you can see the gene expression from two samples from this patient, both containing the FGFR um, uh, gene. Um, ITD um, and showing increased expression of that um, uh, internal tam tandem duplication allele. Okay, um, lastly, in the RNA spectrum, you know, we're interested in um, starting to look at gene expression in a context of detecting immune cell um, infiltration. Um, and so to do this, we've initially used the CyberSort X album, uh, algorithm rather shown here uh, from Ash Lee's group at Stanford. Um, just one of a class of algorithms. I wouldn't advocate for this over the other. Again, much like fusion detection, they sort of have their pluses and minuses. This is really the first one that we've worked with and I'll show some, show some data from that. But we're also looking at timer, um, Excel, and a variety of other algorithms on a pretty regular basis because they do have, again, strengths and weaknesses in terms of different classes of immune uh, cell types that can be deconvoluted from the RNA expression data of the bulk tumor. So just to wrap up this part of the talk, I wanted to give you sort of an aggregate look at what we've been able to do over the three plus years we've been running this protocol in the um, in the translational setting, and um, just some numbers in terms of the different diagnostic, prognostic, or therapeutically relevant findings for different classes of variation are shown here, um, including the prediction of germline cancer predisposition on the far left, all the way through to medically meaningful somatic variants that are indicative of therapy. If you take these data together in aggregate, for all of the patients that have been studied now in excess of 300, so the slide's a little out of date, but the number is basically about the same. Over 90% receive at least one medically meaningful result from this very comprehensive set of uh, approaches uh, to data and algorithmic um, analysis. And so we're kind of at the point now, as I mentioned earlier, where these tests are going into the clinical setting but we're also at the point where we can start looking backwards and evaluating outcomes and the utilization of the data to change diagnosis or treatment. And I think both of these are really important in terms of measuring the impact um, on, our, on our providers and ultimately on our patient population. 
So I just wanted to take a few minutes to kind of tie all of this information together in terms of how it gets all brought together, both in the sort of diagnostic analytical setting, um, but also in terms of how studying patients in this manner can really initiate new hypotheses that lead to new you know, efforts and, and ultimately new therapies or what have you. So I'll try to illustrate that in, in the next few slides. Um, we'll start with just one of our early patients that we evaluated both in the primary and recurrent setting. Um, you can see here just a, a dot plot uh, uh, principal components analysis. I'm indicating that these two patients um, in the, based on their RNA expression, this is the treehouse tool that I talked about a few minutes ago, you know, group fairly closely to one another. Yet if you look at their pathology diagnoses from the primary in 2015 and the recurrent disease in 2017, they are not terribly definitive, mixed glioneuronal tumor or high-grade neuroepithelial tumor in the recurrent setting. These were also characterized by Dave Ellison at St. Jude as an anaplastic ganglioglioma. Um, at the time we were studying these patients, we didn't have the methylation um, profiler, so I don't have that you know, call. But my guess is, is that they would have been in some indeterminate um, diagnosis group just based on things that I know which I'll tell you about right now. So we ran the fusion prediction on the RNA from these um, two samples from this patient. And we were able to identify, this was again early in sort of 2018, um, an EP300 B-core fusion. And we confirmed this clinically in our, um, in our uh, CAPCLIA lab and it, as being present in both tumor cells. So potentially a driver, I guess that's the question. What do you do next? We went and looked in the literature. Um, all we could find at that point in time, early 2018, adult TCGA had an oligodendroglioma that also had an EP300 B core fusion. Not the same fusion, the same two genes, but different exons were involved. Um, and okay, that was sort of one data point. Um, we also found this other paper from 2016 in cell looking at B-core alterations in high-grade um, neuroepithelial tumors. And you can see from this colorful wheel on the right that a subset of these patients had um, a, a B-core internal tandem duplication, not a fusion, but what looked like an activating ITD. And our hypothesis at the time, and we pursued this in terms of the RNA-seq analysis, was to sort of suggest that maybe even though it wasn't the same um, type of alteration in B-Core, potentially that fusion with EP300 was driving some sort of unique gene expression that might be targetable. Um, the patient um, had gone through a secondary therapeutic interval, so didn't really use any of the data we had generated at the time um, of their evaluation. Um, but recurred again with another tumor. And so we then went back to the literature with this EP300 B core finding. In the meantime, in 2019, as you can see here in April, um, uh, Keith Ligon and others um, had produced a report from three other patients, pediatric patients, all of them, with three different B EP300 B core fusions, one of which overlapped with the one that we had identified in our patient. And the um, important um, message from this paper was not only that this was a rare fusion that had now been seen in three and with our patient four patients, but also that it appeared to be driving overexpression of epidermal growth factor receptor, which of course is a druggable target. And this became an important um, component then for our patient for which we were able to confirm clinically the overexpression of the EGFR protein um, and uh, permitted the use of cetuximab in the treatment of this patient. So um, this and other patients like um, this patient with primary and recurrent CNS malignancies really um, began to spark a bit of a hypothesis uh, sort of development exercise in um, the research lab that I run. And so this is really driven by, again, taking a secondary look at the RNA-seq data here you can see um, examples from estimate for this patient, primary and recurrent, where the immune score goes from negative to positive. And correspondingly, on the bottom colorful CyberSort X output, 
in the primary across the top and the recurrent disease across the bottom, you can see that um, there's been sort of a reduction in the T cell component in green and an increase in the macrophage monocyte population in various shades of, I guess, yellow and orange. So, so this is a phenomenon that's not unique to this patient, um, but rather that we see in a repeated way over a across many patients with high-grade gliomas in the recurrent setting. So um, a immune suppressive environment brought on in the recurrent setting by infiltration of macrophages and monocytes, reduction in the T cell um, component. We looked at this a bit further in a conventional immunohistochemistry manner with our colleagues in neuropathology. And again, for the recurrent tumor sections on, along the top, a variety of different immunohistochemistry stains for um, panheme, CD45, et cetera, through CD163 on the far right, which is a one um, macrophage, M2 macrophage marker. We can see an increase across the board again in the recurrent setting compared to the primary along the bottom row. So, um, so an interesting you know, observation um, that we're obviously continuing to collect data on as I'll talk about in a little bit and try to understand um, more about the immune suppressive environment that's brought on by these macrophages and hopefully how to defeat it. But I'll get to that in a second. Um, just to finish this up, um, we also looked at the comparison of mutations between the primary and recurrent disease. That's shown on the left. These are indeed the same tumor, um, but they only share a small number of variants um, there in the center area between the two um, on the graph. Um, many more mutations in the recurrent setting on the y-axis. And then when you take those mutations, translate them to an amino acid change if appropriate, um, and calculate their MHC binding affinities, shown on the right, we can see that the recurrent tumor has a larger proportion of neoantigens predicted than in the primary tumor, as indicated by the red dots at that um, cutoff of uh, 500 nanomolar or less binding affinity. So all of these pieces kind of fit together um, in the context of um, potentially a role for the tumor immune microenvironment in a relationship to increasing neoantigen burden um, and um, again, a possibility for thinking about new therapeutic modalities, which I'll get to in just a moment. One other quick um, patient case. Um, this is one of these outlier cases that you don't see very often, but um, really a patient with an interesting rapid case history is shown here on the different MRIs. So presentation in September of 2019, the large tumor um, shown on the MRI, a gross total resection. And then a follow-up just a month later basically shows the tumor is starting to reestablish itself. So and a couple of intervals with radiation therapy, voliparib, tamazolamide, and then the follow-up in January of 2020, again, shows that the tumor essentially has remained untouched by the therapeutic interval. So another gross total resection followed. We studied this cancer um, using uh, the variety of approaches that I've already told you about, including DNA methylation analysis. So this patient scores well for glioblastoma, IDH wild type in the midline um, at a 0.76. This is actually just a little bit below what we would normally approve in the clinical setting. Our normal cutoff is 0.8. Um, but this is also an older version of the classifier that didn't have as many of these um, types of gliomas, which I'll tell you about in just a minute, included in the machine learning based training set. So the new version 12.3, I think will do a, a better job of classifying this tumor, um, but we haven't done that yet. Anyway, the bottom line is this patient is a Lynch syndrome patient. So um, identified a germline pathogenic founder variant um, shown along the top and then a second hit in the somatic um, tissue, which is a, a sec, which is a, would result in the biallelic inactivation um, and would be indicative of likely response to immune checkpoint blockade. So um, not surprisingly, that was what, um, after some um, immunohistochemistry stains done at the adult hospital uh, for Lynch syndrome genes, uh, you know, demonstrated there was no PMS2 expression and this patient was able to go on to nivolumab 
um, most recent imaging uh, remains at um, no evidence of disease in this 14 year old patient um, who's um, leading a healthy existence at this point in time. Uh, you know, this obviously will be a, a lifelong um, journey, but uh, we we're pretty pleased with this result. And then again, just to bring around the TME component, um, if we look in the primary tumor, which we were able to get um, for study um, from this patient and three sections from the recurrent um, resection, we evaluated again, immunohistochemistry, we're showing here CD163 on the, um, on the uh, left-hand uh, side of the slide for these four different sections of the tumor. Again, the primaries at the bottom increasing staining for M2 macrophages, and then um, three, the corresponding uh, cyber sort analysis for the three sections from the recurrent and the primary along the bottom. Um, so again, a similar story as I've told you about already with increasing macrophage um, and monocyte infiltration in this um, recurrent patient. So as I mentioned, you know, the, the, the value or the virtuous cycle here is that we, we now start to develop hypotheses from these observations in patients as well as work in mouse models. About a year or so ago, we received funding based on some of the preliminary data I just told you about from our group as well as others within our institute to, um, to fund this uh, Cancer Moonshot Pediatric Immunotherapy Drug Discovery Network, U54. And this is um, a three different programs in um, terms of evaluating the value of engineered natural killer cells, oncolytic virus-based therapies, um, and as well as the combination of oncolytic viruses and myeloid suppression targeting um, for sort of novel uh, immunotherapeutics that may be more applicable to pediatric patients who, you know, often don't qualify for immune checkpoint blockade therapies, um, have solid tissue malignancy, so CAR T cell therapy isn't there yet, although I know this is an active area, but maybe just trying to uh, explore some new ideas around how to apply immunotherapy in the pediatric setting. My role is at the bottom here, which is that I'm performing the comprehensive immunogenomics. For the most part, we're also including um, Greg Babahani from OSU, who trained with Gary Nolan as a mass cytometry expert. Um, and we're um, embarking on doing single cell RNA seq as well with our colleague Ryan Roberts here, um, we've learned, who we've learned a lot from and have now expanded out our um, activities. So I'll just give you a quick vignette here in terms of some early data that we generated for this project. And this is in the setting of using an oncolytic herpes simplex virus. Um, that's um, a chimeric virus. Um, it produces um, sort of a novel protein that brings in immune cell infiltration. Um, and this is actually being used right now in a phase one study in adults with recurrent GBM. So it's even made the leap, you know, from preclinical to clinical, although, our, you know, our study, just to be clear with the U54 funding is entirely using a mouse models in the preclinical setting. Here's an example of three of the models of medulloblastoma that are being used. Um, I won't go through the details, but they're largely representative of three of the four classes of, of uh, pediatric medulloblastomas. And this is one of the um, host systems that we're using to evaluate the impact of oncolytic virus therapy using single cell sequencing um, and studying the impact of the oncolytic virus. So, Here's again, just some early data from our single cell efforts showing sort of tumor and normal cells in the mix. Um, uh, on the UMAP projection on the left, um, comparing the C134, the virus treated cells in light blue to just vehicle treated in red. And um, you can see the sort of unique components that seem to be mostly from the virus treated in the light blue um, clusters at the top of the UMAP projection. And then on the right-hand side, those are enumerated out further based on their gene expression profiles into subclusters of the cluster, I guess. Um, although nine looks relatively pure to the, to the naked eye. We, we use CyberSort to actually help try to figure out the immune cell components um, uh, in these clusters uh, at the top. And so I've sort of cut them out and shown them at the top of this slide just for a frame of reference. Um, again, just 
which ones are coming from almost uniquely the virus treated. And then if we look at the different clusters enumerated on the right-hand side of the slide, according to the cyber sort evaluation of their content based on gene expression, we can see that this number nine cluster here in the teal um, on the far left of the cluster diagram, um, largely is comprised of natural killer cells and some different T cells. Um, so, you know, just one way to sort of um, evaluate the impact that the virus is having on recruitment into the tumor um, mass itself. So I just want to finish with two quick thoughts about where we're going with all of this. One internal and one, well, pardon the pun, nationwide. So I'll get to that one in a moment. But the, the internal one is that, you know, in um, collaboration with Miriam Filati, who's shown along the bottom of the slide on the far left of the three pictures, and Ralph Saloom, um, two neuro-oncologists. Miriam is our new division chief in neuro-oncology as of last July. Um, we've developed out a clinical trial concept to really start to drive precision pediatric medicine in the high grade glioma setting. So these are the most lethal cancers in kids. Um, there's really nothing that's moved the needle on outcomes for these patients, you know, over the last 30 years. And, um, you know, we feel a, a compelling need to start evaluating new approaches that can really be helpful. And one potential here is just molecular stratification based on this broad scale molecular characterization that I've been talking about. So you can see this all in the you know, diagram um, that's here on the slide. Um, this is a phase two clinical trial with genomic guidance around which of these um, you know, different categories patients will sort out into according to the genomic profiling that's being performed in the clinical setting here at IgM and then parsed out to assign them onto an appropriate arm. This will not be sort of the total number of arms, but this is kind of where we are right now. As many of you can appreciate, this involves extensive you know, um, discussions with different pharmaceutical companies, et cetera. Um, but we've also designed some, I think, nice correlative research, which is now again, exploring some of the things that we're starting to take for granted in the adult precision cancer world, like evaluation of peripheral blood, not just for genomic markers, but also for immunologic, you know, recruitment um, into the, into the um, brain in these patients with recurrent cancers, et cetera. The other thing I really wanna point out here, and this is important, these are for patients with a primary diagnosis. So we're not waiting till patients are heavily treated with immune crushing therapies like temozolomide or what have you. This is going to be for newly diagnosed patients. So again, really, I think an opportunity to start to at least move the needle um, on this. And finally, this is being offered through Connect Consortium, um, which is an international tr uh, clinical trials uh, network. Miriam is the PI on that. And so we'll have opportunities to open this in different parts of the US, Australia, um, uh, Germany, as well as the UK. And then finally, I'll just finish with the really new, new stuff. And that is something that hasn't really been announced. So keep it to yourself. Um, but finally, we've got a situation where NCI is really starting to um, imagine and understand the value of comprehensive molecular profiling in kids and um, have uh, just recently, you know, the ink is not yet dry, uh, signed a contract to begin to roll out pediatric comprehensive mole molecular profiling to um, patients enrolling onto COG trials. So this is, for those of you who may be involved with COG, this was just socialized at the last uh, COG meetings end of September. Um, this has really been driven by Doug Hawkins, the CEO chair, and um, at the NCI, Malcolm Smith. And I think, you know, is a very exciting opportunity for us to begin really per performing these molecular characterizations for kids with cancer, much like has been done for the last five years in Germany, the last three years in Australia, I could go on, but we're a little bit behind here. So um, nothing different really than what I've already described other than a very fast turnaround. We're trying to accomplish Archer profiling for fusions, methylation profiling for CNS malignancies, and tumor normal exome, as I've already described, within a 14-day turnaround time, uh, return of results to the ordering physician hospital 
um, COG group, if you will, um, all by electronic means and secure Amazon data delivery um, mechanisms um, that can, you know, have unique logins for each site, et cetera. So really trying to move um, this into the electronic age as well as into the uh, molecular characterization age. Excitingly, the data from this will not just go back to COG, but actually will go back to COG for clinical annotation and then de-identify deposition into the Childhood Cancer Database Initiative public repository within 90 days of our tests being resulted out by a clinical director. So this will be, you know, a resource that's now becoming available for data mining and further discovery to really enhance and what we're learning and start that virtuous cycle over again that I was talking about just a few minutes ago, but now uh, across the nation. And this will go on for the next five years, but I think it's an exciting first step towards really getting every child in America uh, access to this type of molecular profiling um, with a cancer diagnosis. So we're excited about it. Um, I'll just finish by saying, you know, here are the conclusions. I think we're really starting as, as well as others to drive this um, notion around, you know, a full DNA RNA characterization for our pediatric patients. And also realizing that, you know, what we learn can be very important for next steps um, in the treatment of these patients as I've tried to illustrate with a brief example. So I'll just finish here. Um, acknowledging everyone, you know, it takes a, a large group. It definitely takes excited clinical collaborators. Um, they're listed on the right-hand side of this slide, along with some of my other collaborators. And I really want to finish by thanking our patients and families um, for their participation in this, you know, protocol over the last three years and um, to the benefit of patients to come. Thanks very much. Thank you, Elaine. That was fantastic. I will clap on behalf of everyone. <laughs> And um, if people want to put their hands up to ask questions, that would be great. Or you can post in the chat. And maybe I'll take the first one, which I think dwells on my mind a lot and a lot of people. And it's more, uh, more around the infrastructure and not, and not the science. I normally talk only about the science. But you know, on that last slide, you had Amazon Web Services as an integral component of the bioinformatics and the delivery. Yeah. yeah. And obviously, you've gone, like you said, full AWS. Yeah. And I wanted to ask. Is that mainly because of the your desire to do the clinical implementation, or are you using that fully on the research side as well? Because you know we do many of us here now doing hybrid, some on high performance computing, some on supercomputing, some on the cloud, and it gets pretty messy. And so, have you moved your whole research endeavor to AWS, or is that mainly? you were thinking about that for clinical delivery. We've moved every bit of it there. The challenge was really getting the HIPAA compliance um, regulatory piece in place. Um, you know, that took the effort about a year's time to really satisfy our um, internal HIPAA compliance IT a group that the data were going to be secure, more secure in the Amazon Web Services Cloud than we could make them on-prem. And um, so we did successfully document that. That's been some time ago now, but yes, the, the idea was really to take everything into the cloud. Um, we've done you know, multiple um, mathematical comparisons to what that costs to, you know, in comparison to having you know, your own um, on-prem uh, computing uh, with regard to all of the things that I don't want, you know, need to go over, but we all know what they are. And, and, and it basically comes out very, very favorably um, in that regard. Not the least of which is that, you know, we're really not restricted in a way in terms of the scalability. Yeah. So, you know, literally as many CPUs as you need, you can have, obviously that costs more, but in high demand, um, I think that can be really, you know, incredibly economically satisfying because you're not queuing, you're basically just using as much as is, is available. Um, maybe it's not infinite, you know, but it approaches infinity, I'm pretty sure. Um, just kidding. So, so I think, you know, the, the math is there. Um, 
I guess the reality of the question is, you know, is the, is the Amazon Web Services Cloud always available? The answer is no, painfully not. And so we do have, you know, some minimal amount of on-prem yeah. that, you know, is just a safeguard more than anything. Um, but it's not the focus and, and it's used for both re research as well as, um, as well as clinical. The other advantage is really data delivery. So we do a lot of genomic services here, especially for the cancer center at OSU. So we're the genomic resource for the cancer center. So all of their sequencing comes to us. And in many cases, it's much more facile for those investigators to grab their aligned BAM files or their FASTQ or whatever they want you know, to have delivered, including analyzed results from their bucket in the web, uh, in the Amazon cloud compared to like sneaker net or other ridiculous things that have gone on in the past. So that's also a data delivery aspect that we find uh, valuable. Okay. okay. So a quick question from the, um, from the chat from Jin Hong Wang. She asked, um, or he asked, um, does the Churchill alignment work for mouse? And yeah. then what is the best algorithm for detecting these fusions, variants, ITDs, et cetera? Yes, is the answer to that question. Um, I'm just kidding. So we, we do have a Churchill mouse um, implementation as well that does everything from alignment to um, variant annotation uh, because we do so much mouse work as I tried to illustrate both for single cell as well as for um, bulk cell. Um, you know, the, the gene fusion question um, is really, our focus has not been so much on DNA. I'll be honest with you. It's really been more at the RNA level. Um, and so that's the reason for this ensemble approach that I talked about. Um, we do go back to look for evidence of the structural variant if that's indicated by the gene fusion analysis in the exome data. And often that's a nice, you know, validation that, hey, with, you know, there's a BRAF, you know, Kia BRAF fusion, and we see amplification of the BRAF locus that's indicative of, you know, a fusion, the pileup of, you know, soft clip reads, et cetera, um, in, the, in the IGV plot. Um, but we haven't really spent a lot of time doing de facto structural variant detection um, from the DNA level. It's a little different than the adult setting, um, quite frankly. Um, complex genomic rearrangements is an interesting beast. So the answer there is really that short read technology is woefully underpowered for many of these complex variants. We've worked with PacBio sequencing since literally at WashU, we had the very first PacBio sequencer that was ever placed externally to the factory there in California. Um, they look much different now and you don't need to reinforce the floor so they don't fall through anymore. But um, we have two SQL twos and we have really developed out, we're just finalizing a manuscript actually on this. We've really developed out their ISOSeq protocol for evaluating complex rearrangements, but again, at the RNA level and then making sense of that back in the DNA. And we have some lovely examples that I just you know don't ever have time to present on that from our cancer um, protocol where we've been really able to tease out the truth of the genomic rearrangement, its complexity and its details using the interplay between the long read RNA-seq and the, and the you know, um, tumor normal exome data. Um, and, and then the ITD question, I mean, I think Cicero is the only thing that we've really tried. Um, it turns out to work pretty well. I would also say for people who are fans of Archer DX, Fusion Plex, which I also mentioned that we use, that they now have in their latest version of software, which is I think seven, but don't quote me on that. Um, they do have the capability to identify ITDs and that actually looks reasonably robust. I think the really intriguing question about around ITDs is that, you know, we've known some of these for a long time, FLT3 ITD and AML, for example, they're activating alterations and they can, um, can be quite good drivers, but I feel like the challenges of identifying them computationally has really hindered our maybe appreciation of how frequent they are. So I think this is maybe a, a story that's gonna roll out over the next you know, year or so in terms of really better detection and more of realization of the fact that they're more prevalent drivers than I think was previously appreciated. Yeah. Totally makes sense. Okay, I'll be happy to open up if anyone 
has any questions from the audience? Yeah, ask away. There is science. I hope everyone can unmute. I presume they can. So if there are no questions. Oh, we're right at the top of the hour. So it's pretty good timing, I suppose. Yes, exactly. And Elaine is only two hours away. So. That's Elaine, right. Phenomenal yes. job. This is Mike Besicher. Um, hey, how really are you? Yeah. Long uh, time I really enjoyed is. it. <laughs> yep. uh, we'll have to come visit once uh, uh, I'm mobile again. Uh, but uh, yeah. uh, very, very much appreciate you being here. Oh, thanks so much. It's it's nice to see you again. It's been a, a while. Um, yep. I think I just invoked your name the other day, as a matter of fact, but in a very positive way, as always. Good, good. That's that that that's what at least happens every once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> Keep up the great work and good news on the NCI uh, announcement. That's going to be phenomenal for kids across the country. Yeah, I just can't tell you how excited I am to be a part of that. It's I think it's going to really be a game changer. So thanks. Totally agree. All right. Well, look forward to Good. seeing you guys at some point in real life. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, in Lane. person. All really right. Thanks so much. Yep. Take Bye, care, everyone. all.